Okay, welcome to the Let Off Podcast, episode one. This is the first official podcast. Uh, it, this one's going to be me getting into the nitty gritty of some stuff. I got a really cool topic to talk about that I think will set a great foundation for what this show is really about. So if you're here as a first time listener and this show just came out, Thank you so much for being one of the original supporters and being here from the beginning with me. If you are here after the show is established and uh, you're going back to the first episode to listen through them all, I think that's super cool. And thank you for being here. Um, I'm also going to get into some questions. I got a bunch of questions after I put the feelers out there uh, on Instagram and I sent out an email for people to write in questions that'll be answered on the first show. I actually got so many that I'm not going to cover them all in this episode because I want to save some for the next show. So if I don't get to yours in this episode, I apologize, but I absolutely will in the next episode. So I'll pull those up here. Um, but the topic today is the process I go through for a complete bow build. So as you guys may or may not know, I run a bow shop here in Calgary. It's appointment only. So you have to get in contact with me to come to the shop. But, um, and I, I just do that for privacy reasons because it's, you know, out of my basement. But um, I have had a busy spring, which is awesome because normally people come to me in the end of summer when there's two weeks until season and they want a ton of work done and I get extremely overwhelmed. So uh, thank you to everyone who's brought a bow to me in a more timely manner this year. It's awesome. I can spend more time on it and make it perfect. Um, but the point is, uh, the biggest thing that you're going to see when you have your own little shop, and you know, if you do this for yourself or for other people, the point is always the same. You want your bow to be perfect. Take this bow, make it perfect, pair it with perfect arrows. That's what I'm asked all the time. Um, you know, people bring a bow in and they say, you know, I bought this however many years ago. Uh, it was set up at the pro shop and it hasn't been touched since. Make it perfect and I want new arrows. That is like the foundation of everything you're going to be asked in your shop if you do this for others. And like I said, if you do it for yourself, that's the whole point. If you're here on this show and you watch my YouTube and all that, you likely want your stuff to be perfect and if you don't want that level of fine detail put into your bow and your arrows and everything you do in bow hunting this show isn't for you this is uh this is for the detail oriented this is for you if you want your stuff to be perfect so i'm going to break down the whole process because i did this like five or six times in the last few weeks with you know real people bringing their stuff into me here's my bow I want new arrows, make it all perfect. So the first thing that I need to do is check the timing and the basic things on the bow that are either right or wrong. So there's a saying that I really enjoy. It is that we don't tune a bow, we set up a bow, we tune our arrows. So what that means, I mean, you hear it said all the time, I got to get my bow tuned, or I just tuned my bow. Tuning would indicate that there is some level of right or wrong, depending on your setup, right? When you tune an instrument, you're tuning a guitar to a certain standard, right? You're in E standard tuning, which tuning a guitar is different than tuning a bass or tuning a violin, right? With archery, things are either right or wrong. It's either set up right or wrong with your bow, not with your arrows. So what that means is things like your timing, things like your cam lean, um, your specs in general, your axle to axle, your brace height, that stuff is either right or wrong. Uh, there is not wiggle room with that. We get to tuning when we talk about arrows and that's what I'll get into after, still in this episode. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check what the draw weight currently is. And I have a big whiteboard in my shop that I, I write your name down, make and model bow, and then all these specs. So I'll take the draw weight. I'll take the draw length just as a baseline of where we started when we came into the shop. 
uh, the very first thing I'm going to do is check the timing. Usually the timing is off. Um, so if you don't know how to check timing, I have a video on YouTube. Obviously, that's a challenging thing to show on a podcast. That's just audio. But I have a great YouTube video. I have a full bow build series, actually, on the Tooth of the Arrow um, Tooth of the Arrow Broadhead's YouTube channel. You can check that out for, you know, step-by-step -step visual of everything I'm talking about here. So I'll check the timing. I'll make the cable adjustments to make that timing perfect. Once I do that, I'll, I'll look at cam lean um, and just get it set, you know, by my eye. I don't use lasers or anything to make sure my cam lean is perfect you will know by the end of this process whether or not it's perfect. When you're checking cam lean, you can do it either by holding your bow out in front of you and looking straight down the string. Like if you were to put your bow straight in front of you and tilt it all the way forward so that the string is level with the horizon and you're looking straight down the string like you're looking down an arrow. For example, you'll be generally able to tell whether or not there's cam lean by where the string comes off the cam. You'll see the string is perfectly straight and it might look like it takes a small right or left turn at the cam and you can flip it one way or another um, and you can usually tell if there's a bit of cam lean by that. You can also very commonly tell at full draw. So I'll just draw the bow with an arrow or a safety release, right? You never draw your bow with your normal release without an arrow, derails happen and it can screw up your day. Uh, and it's kind of scary too. Um, but yeah, if you draw your bow um, and look up and down the same way you we were talking about before, look at the cam and see how the string comes off it. You can very commonly tell whether or not there is any lean in the cam. Now, not all bows can have the cam lean controlled. Uh, like I know I just worked on a, a Bowtech Carbon Icon and it's a simple bow. It's a great bow, but it doesn't have any way for me to adjust that cam lean. So if you don't have split yokes, it's going to be very difficult for you to do this. If you have the new Bowtech, uh, what do they call it? The deadlock system. That's a super easy way um, to adjust your cam lean is basically moving the cam left or right. Um, so Unless there's a, a big, you're, you're seeing a big lean in that cam, don't worry too much about this. Like I say, it'll come out paper tuning. But if you see a big left or right lean, you have to make that adjustment. Um, it's a yoke tuning adjustment. If you have yokes, uh, it may or may not be a shimming adjustment. Generally, shimming is something to stay away from because nine times out of 10 or more, the bow will come out of the factory properly shimmed. So anyways, that was a lot about cam lean, but it's important to check because if you have crazy cam lean and you start working on this stuff, you can actually get a bow derail just from crazy enough cam lean. So I'm just checking it for safety and to make sure that I'm starting this bow build off with nothing way out of whack. Now, the next thing that's really important is to check the specs of the bow, the factory specs. So you'll want to go and Google the make and model specs. For example, um, you know, I'll do it on my computer right now with my new bow, PSC Mach 30 DS specs. That's the bow I just built for myself. So you'll find it, even for all the old bows, you'll find their specs online, they're all out there. The ones we're interested in are the brace height and the axle to axle. So for my PSC Mach 30 DS, six inch brace height, and a 30 inch axle to axle. All you need to do here is verify that those numbers that it says on your spec sheet are accurate to what you see in front of you. This is really important and I don't see a lot of guys doing this. Um, axle to axle. So when you look at your cams, you'll see the axle that goes right through them. That is a fixed point. It does not move. The cam rotates around that axle. From the center of that axle to the center of the other one, that's obviously your axle to axle. And if you're reading from center to center, that's very important because a quarter inch means something is off. If it's, you know, this is, my bow is a 30 inch exactly. And if it's 30 and a quarter inch, it means your bow is out of spec. So make sure you're getting a very accurate measurement. Center of axle to center of axle. 
Uh, it's very, very common that you're going to see the axle to axle on the bow that you're measuring be longer than it should be. This comes from cable stretching. Natural, it happens over time. At the same time as that happens, the brace height is going to increase as well. So the brace height is, I mean, it's, it's a linear relationship with axle to axle in the way that the cable stretch impacts this stuff. So once you get your axle to axle back to spec, your brace height should be back to spec as well. As long as the string builder, whoever made your strings, made the string length and the cable lengths correctly and, and, and they're proper set, um, axle to axle is the only thing you need to adjust to get brace height back to square. Um, I just look at brace height because it's, it's a second feature that will tell me whether or not this bow is perfect. So as your cables stretch over time, that increases your axle to axle and it takes off some of the stress on the limbs. Uh, you, you can picture exactly how this works. Visualize it with me here. You have your bow and the cables are what is holding the limbs in their position. If the cables get longer, the limbs are gonna move outward, meaning there's less flex on them. What you get there is a decrease in your draw weight. So this just happened the other day. I was working on a buddy's brand new Matthews and I had, I had the bow peaked for draw weight and it had the 70 pound module on it. Um, cause those new Matthews, you change the draw weight, um, from, you know, class to class. So 60 to 70 to 80 pounds, not by changing the limbs, but by changing a module on the cam, which is kind of cool. And then within that module, you have, you know, 10 to 15 pounds of adjustment by turning your limb bolts. Um, Anyways, I had it maxed out. The limb bolts were peaked minus quarter turn. That's very important. Uh, you all you never want to shoot your limb bolts bolts fully torqued. Always go to, to the top of the limb bolt and back it out a quarter, just to avoid that stress uh, that gets applied when you come to full draw in the limb pocket there. Um, so it was peaked. And it was like 63 pounds and I verified and both the modules were correct 70. So the first thing I did was measure the axle to axle. And for whatever reason, the axle to axle was off. So, it, and it was long. So I add two full twists at a time to each cable and this shouldn't impact timing. We verify it again later, but if you're adding the same amount to each cable, it shouldn't impact timing. Um, so I add two twists to each side. We draw it. We're at like 66 pounds now. Do it again. We're at like 69. Uh, another time, add a twist and a half or whatever. And I got it right to 70 and a half, um, I think. And then lo and behold, I measured the axle to axle and it was perfect. So before it wasn't, I shortened those cables. Now the axle to axle is correct. The brace height was correct. I did that as a verifying check and the draw weight was now where it should have been. So what happened is, you know, they didn't twist those cables up enough when they, when they put them on the bow, um, you know, maybe they stretched, it's unlikely, but one way or another, the cables were too long for the bow and that threw everything else off. So I digress because this is long winded, but this is important stuff. So we check all those specs. If the bow is out, we get it back to spec. Um, and then it's, kind of time to move on to arrows. I mean, there is stuff you need to do in the arrow rest and there is a setup component to the site, but none of that really matters until you have arrows. So for arrows, and this is like the vast majority of the work that goes into arrows. I use a program called Archer's Advantage. It's a fantastic software. I'm not sponsored by them. They have no idea who I am. I just love the product. What I'll do is I'll go into Archer's Advantage and it's like 10 bucks a year or something. It's the best money you'll ever spend if you're into this stuff. You will pick the make and model of the bow you're working on. You'll enter the draw length. You'll enter the draw weight, every spec you can for that bow and it calibrates everything for you. Then you're gonna go enter the information for the current arrow. Um, you know, carbon to carbon length, number of fletching, type of fletching, it gets so detailed. 
And I will then shoot it through a chronograph with the old arrow because you need a real arrow speed with your old setup to calibrate the whole system. Once you do that, and I put in, you know, 275 feet per second or whatever, click enter, the whole system calibrates. And now the world is your oyster. I go into this system and I can create any arrow that I want, any make and model point weight. I can change my fletching configuration. I can change the brand of fletching if I want with this thing. And it will show me on a graph how that arrow matches to your bow. This is called spine matching. It's a very important concept that I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about on this show. But that's the majority of the process. From I mean, obviously, I'm skipping some of the fine details, but I just wanted to set the foundation with this first episode of here's what I do in a complete bow build. Here's the point of this whole show. And going forward, we'll get into the details of some of this stuff. Um, but this is a great foundation and if this interests you you're going to really like this show so then you know i'll build an arrow according to what this program archer's advantage tells me is perfect we're trying to make an arrow that is mathematically perfect for your bow and you know then then the smaller details arrow rest setup your your sight setup that stuff come into play um shoot it through paper get yourself a perfect bullet hole and you're off to the races. That is the process. You set up the bow, you make sure the bow is in spec, you build an arrow that is mathematically perfect for that bow. In a nutshell, that's the entire bow build process. So of course, there's a lot more to it than that. Every single sentence that I said there can be broken down into greater detail, but there's a lot of episodes to go here. So I think that's a that's a cool foundation. That's a cool starting point. It's been really on my mind because I've just done it so much lately. Um, and it's fun. I love doing this stuff. So I want to get into some of the user questions here. I got a bunch, but I will answer. I, re I emailed back a, a few people and said, yes, I'll read it on the first episode. So uh I'm going to hold my word on that because these were the first people who wrote in. So the very first one was from Justin Jackson. So Justin wrote in saying, I have a broadhead tech question for your first podcast. I know nothing about grades or scales of metal, steel, aluminum. I think there's industry standards steel makers must meet. So is a said grade of steel made in China meeting the same standards per grade as made in Canada, Mexico, or the USA. Long-winded, I know, but I don't know the correct terminology. That's fine. I'm not uh, a huge steel guy either, so I don't know all the terminology on this either. But I know the answer to this question. Congrats on the new podcast. Eagerly waiting to follow along, Justin J. Thank you, Justin. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope I can give you a good answer to this. Um, basically, every category of metal has a range and you know steel is made up of multiple ingredients it's iron and carbon and small amounts of lead and uh, et cetera et cetera um to be considered a grade of steel it does have to follow the certain i guess you could say recipe and it does have to meet some standards but foreign standards and north american standards do differ just in the tightness of the tolerances, I guess you could say. American steel, and I know Canadian steel, um, they are heavily tested and pretty rigorously inspected to say and prove that it is the steel you're saying it is, that the amount of each ingredient in the steel is accurate to the type of steel that you're saying you're producing. Um, I, I know that with foreign steels, particularly in China, the standards get overlooked a little bit you know there's a wider range in which they're accepted because it cuts costs that's the biggest thing i mean we all know the point of chinese production is to cut costs um so to produce steel in north america does cost significantly more because of the testing that it undergoes and because of the amount of detail that's put into making sure 
that grade of steel is perfectly consistent, right? If you have, let's just say broadheads, because I, you know, I, I work with a broadhead company quite closely, so I know about this. If you have Chinese broadheads, you can buy that same broadhead, you know, today and then a year from now, and it might be the same in every way to your eye, but one might have a slightly lower grade of steel just because that particular batch, um, you know, kind of just got passed off. It, they don't test it to the same level. Whereas in America and in Canada, the steel that's produced is extremely consistent, which is really important in things like broadheads. And I mean, steel in general, buildings are like skyscrapers have a huge amount of steel in them. You'd hope that that steel has been tested and is consistent and that it meet spec. So that's the biggest difference between foreign and American or Canadian steel. Basically, there's a universal standard for the metal, yes, but not every producer will follow those standards in these foreign countries where they're producing things as cheap as possible. Corners get cut. The quality of the product is less. So I hope that answers your question maybe too thoroughly, but that's a, that is a good question. That's a very good one. Um, thank you, Justin. The next one is from Phil Madonna. Uh, thanks for writing in Phil. Phil says, how do you know if an arrow spine is too stiff or not stiff enough? Is there an optimal stiffness for a hunting shaft? Uh, great question. You know, I, I get really caught up in talking about all the spine matching and my software that I use, Archer's Advantage, that I do forget that some people are still learning what aerospine means in general. Like I, I go off the deep end too much um, and I want to, and I'm going to dial that back a bit. So thank you for the reminder, Phil, that uh, sometimes I go too deep into those topics without explaining everything. So basically your bow produces a certain amount of energy that's consistent shot to shot. It's a fixed, it doesn't change. Your arrow is designed to take and use a certain amount of energy, which is also fixed. If you don't have the energy that your arrow is designed to take and that your bow outputs matched very, very closely, your arrow flight will not be good. Simply put, your arrows will not fly good. This is where you see issues like fishtailing. This is where, you know, if you've ever said, I can't get fixed blade broadheads to fly with my setup, this is probably your issue. What all this means, if they're not matched, they're either, your arrows are either too stiff or too weak. So the higher output of a bow, the stiffer the arrow needs to be to match the energy. The lower the output of bow, the lower the output of the bow, the weaker the arrow needs to be to match that energy. And it's not a matter of, you know, a stiff arrow is stronger than a weak arrow. Don't think of it like that. Weak just in this context means less stiff, okay? Is there an optimal stiffness for a hunting shaft? Yes, but it all depends on your bow. It all depends on your draw length, your draw weight, your point weight, the uh, arrow manufacturer you, that you're using. Uh, so this is where that Archer's Advantage program I talk about comes in handy. You'll plug all your stuff in and it will tell you whether or not the arrow that you've been using is too stiff or not stiff enough. Um, it'll allow you to build an arrow that is perfect in its spine for your setup. That's the only way to know for sure. You can get close by going to an arrow manufacturer's website and make sure you're not using a generic spine chart. You want to be using, you know, manufacturer by manufacturer that is slightly different. So if you're shooting Easton arrows, look at the Easton arrow spine chart. Uh, you find your carbon to carbon arrow length. Um, and your draw weight, but all of this is in a range, so it'll never be perfect. You know, it'll say 28 inch arrow at 60 to 65 pounds needs, you know, 340 spine, 400 spine, whatever. Um, 
that's the starting point. And you can look at that if you're, if you just have no idea if your spine is even close, like, you know, you bought your arrows from some guy on Facebook or whatever, and you have no idea that'll be a starting point to tell you if you're close. But if you want that level of, you know, just fine detail to know, is it perfect or not? And how close or far from perfect is it? You can't do that without a software. There's a lot of softwares like pinwheel is one. Uh, I just have had such great success with Archer's advantage that that's the one I use. Um, so if you use that and listen to the show, you'll be able to follow along really well. But I mean, at the end of the day, they're all kind of the same. So how do you know if it's the arrow spine is too stiff or not stiff enough? Um, yeah. Like I say, you can get a close, close reading kind of by looking at a spine chart, but you will not know unless you run it through a program. So those are the first two questions. I have more here. I'll do one more and then I'll save the rest for episode two. Um, Jonathan, thank you for writing in, Jonathan. Do you plan to still keep doing the YouTube videos? Uh, yeah, 100%. I do weekly YouTube videos. This podcast will probably be bi-weekly, at least to start. Um, there are certain things which I cannot accurately depict on a podcast. You know, when I'm showing you how to do something on your bow or how to put something together, blah, blah, blah. I need the video format to do that. I know a lot of people like YouTube, so I'm not going to give that up. Uh, th that will still be coming at you with the same frequency that it currently does. Um, I may replace, you know, I do Friday video drops, so I might replace the odd one with a podcast episode just while we get going, you know, to boost the podcast and let people know it's out there. But no, the YouTube is not going anywhere. I just realized that there's a lot of YouTube videos that are just me standing there talking. And there's no visual component to it. I'm not doing anything. I'm just standing there talking. And some of these videos are the ones that get the most views. So people clearly like that. I just don't need to be on camera. So the podcast is a cool way that I can continue to give this information to you more in depth. Um, maybe longer winded answers. If you like that type of thing, you'll certainly get that here if you can't tell that already. Um, and you can be doing chores, you know, you can be driving and you cleaning your house or fleshing arrows while you're listening to this stuff. And it just makes it a bit more consumable, I guess, um, I guess you could say. So that will conclude the first episode. Thank you again for listening. Um, shout out to our title sponsor, Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads. Uh, you know, I, I shot those broadheads for two and a half years before I had any affiliation with the company. I had never spoken to Luke, who's the owner. Uh, I shot those broadheads for two and a half years of a lot of animals. And I went to many countries with those broadheads before I ever even spoke to them. So I really believe in the product and very thankful that they're sponsoring the show. Uh, thank you guys for joining me on the first episode here. Stay tuned for the second one where I will have a guest who's a really cool dude. Thank you guys.